Okay, so thanks very much for coming. I'm going to talk, uh, I gave it a little bit of a funny title here called Stamps, Who Needs Them? But I'm really sort of talking about the development of typologies and, and cataloging. Um, I do collect the non-stamp postal history of Botswana. That's my interest in the topic here and kind of how I got to it. But uh, why do I collect this stuff? So I currently live in Nova Scotia, Canada. That's my hometown. Um, I lived in Botswana from 1994 to 2002. And uh, I had a company there for about the last six years that I lived there on my own, uh, did environmental consulting, landscape architecture, land use planning. Um, but my interest in stamp collecting, probably like many people, uh, I start collecting them as a kid, uh, you know, got stuff from my parents and aunts and uncles and things like that, but uh, got to high school and university and other things uh, intervened and my interest kind of dropped off. But when I moved to Botswana in 94, uh, pre-internet days, people were sending me letters and things and got these uh, envelopes and things that had lovely Canadian stamps on them. So I started reignited my interest in Canadian stamps. Uh, kind of on my own, looked for people who were interested in stamp collecting and joined the stamp club there. And that got my interest going in the stamps of Botswana. And uh, it's interesting, Botswana is a uh, good place. They have a very conservative stamp issuing policy. They only issue maybe... Uh, three or four issues a year. They're not like some other places that issue 20 or 30 issues a year trying to make money. So uh, very quickly had developed quite a good collection of just the normal stamps of Botswana. Um, and material that I didn't have it was starting to get quite expensive because you had to start collecting the errors and freaks and oddities and I just didn't have the money for that. So I started looking for some other topics. So I looked at um, the meter marks of Botswana. I, I recognize that lots of mail moves by meter uh, same like in North America, probably uh, at the time when I was starting to collect in uh, 2000 uh, or late 90s, early 2000s, probably about 85% of the mail moved by meters in North America. It was the same situation in Botswana. And nobody was collecting this or thinking about the postal history of this and how did that kind of do it. So that, that got me going. Then as I was kind of rummaging through that stuff, I got interested in these, which are uh, on official free covers. So they've got the mark on there, it's official free. So uh, in Botswana, it still occurs today, mail that's being delivered by government departments, armed forces, schools, uh, hospitals, things like that. If they put an official free stamp on it and it says on Botswana government service on it, <coughs> then it can move through the mail uh, free of charge for those organizations. Uh, then uh, this is another thing, uh, is government printed envelopes. So Peter Tai, who's the uh, editor of the uh, Philatelic Society of Greater Southern Africa newsletter and looks at registration envelopes, actually has a display here on it, uh, got me into this. He was saying, well, there's these envelopes that the government uses and they're marked on Botswana Government Service or on Botswana Postal Service. Uh, it'd be interesting to start to try to look at those and develop a typology and talk about those a little bit. So that's another piece that's caught my eye. Um, you'll notice no stamps so far, so continuing with that theme, was permit mail. So uh, probably, again, early 2000s or so, Botswana introduced the ability for companies to do permit mail, where they would just have to mark it with a permit, and they would just pay a charge per month and charge per how many uh, covers they were using and things like that, rather than having to apply a meter or a stamp, uh, just try to reduce charges and things like that. Then registration labels. I want to still have something you had to lick and stick. <laughs> so these were things that uh, were still there. So uh, these, the label here on the cover, um, start looking at those. And uh, I quite enjoy looking at those because uh, it takes me back to actually the villages. I've visited many of the villages in Botswana when I live there. So I can look at some of these and, and have good recollections of those places. The thing about cataloging, the issue I have is I probably have over 3,000 covers from Botswana. When I live there, um, I used to have a deal with a medical um, insurance company uh, for the cost of four Cokes every two weeks. I'd get a box about uh, you know, two feet by two feet by two feet full of covers. All their mail would come in and so every two weeks I'd go in and the people in the mail room, I'd give them a Coke and uh, they'd give me a box of uh, their covers that they were saving. So I would go through that, pull out the stuff I wanted and then uh, hang on to the other stuff because we're stamp collectors so you never throw anything away. So I have about 3,000 covers, and even in the early days, I was having trouble. How do I keep track of this? How do I know what I have and don't have? And I was sometimes buying some things. So I was getting duplicates, and I want to stop doing that uh, uh, so that I could save the money for the stuff that I wanted. 
So I started uh, in Excel and made like an Excel spreadsheet and doing that, but it didn't really have the sophistication for uh, sorting things in, in the ways that I wanted to do it. Then uh, I was in a Mac in computer environment when I lived in Botswana, so I was using FileMaker Pro uh, to try that, but uh, it was starting to uh, lose uh, sort of support and becoming a secondary program, so it was not so good. But when I moved to Canada, I moved into a PC environment again and had access to Microsoft Access, which I started to use to do that. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit around the cataloging is sort of how I've done it, some of the typologies I've worked on, and then I'm going to end uh, with the talk just talking about how I kind of keep these things sorted. So uh, the meter mark, so that's a picture of a typical meter mark there, uh, the red sort of square stamp, uh, things like that. When I look at it, I, uh, what are the different pieces of it? And that's what this describes here, uh, because I look at these different pieces here, help me to determine the typology. So, uh, you know, looking at the uh, indicia, uh, what the prefix is. If I get my thing here, so prefix, the letter there, what's the license number. Um, setting is the space between the sort of town mark here and the uh, indicia, date, and if it has a slogan or not, and things like that. So starting to look at those pieces. So the basis of my cataloging, when I look at that, uh, I start off looking at the basic shape. So what's the marked differences in the frame style of the indicia? And I'll show you some examples in a minute like that. Then to get into the idea of type is what's the size of the indicia? size of the setting, frame style, what's it say in the inscription or in that sort of town mark piece. And then we get down into varieties if you're getting really uh, anal about this. As I say, you're like really getting into trying to define the different pieces and there's like date layout and text size and things like that. Look at that. So this is an example here um, of type one when I look at it. So if we look over at the table here, those things, size of indicia, size of setting, frame style, that determines the type. And these pieces determine the variety. So if we look at this, these are the examples of the uh, types over here. Um, so the first two here, are 1A1 is the numbering. So 1 uh, means that's the sort of uh, grouping. So these all look fairly similar. And then A, there's some differences between these two pieces in terms of... Uh, the difference here is in terms of the uh, layout of the value. So if we look here, it's just uh, two numbers with a uh, equal sign at the end here. It's equal sign with some different numbers in front. And then if we look at this one here called 1B1, what's happened here is the size of the uh, indicia is different, settings different, uh, frame style is a little bit different as well. And then that makes it into type B. And then we also can notice that the numbering style is different. So that's how I kind of get into this. So if you look at my exhibit out in the exhibit hall, you'll see I've got 20 different uh, major um, groupings. And then they're broken down into these different types and things like that. So this is the database. I know you can't read that at all. But just looking at it, uh, what I've done is set it up in such a way that I have the prefix as a separate thing, license, licensee data issued and different information on it and then the way it works is underneath that this if I just click on the little arrow or plus sign on the edge here it lists all the covers that I have so if I'm looking to say okay what are all the covers that I have of this certain uh, license number what does that look like but I can also sort it if we look uh, I'm just trying to find it here when I got my type number so my typology is here I can also just take the whole database and sort it by typology. So I could say, what are all the 1B1s I have? So what are all the companies that use that? And then I can also have, since I have dates in here, I can very easily figure out earliest and latest dates of pieces. So it lets me sort the uh, things in a whole variety of ways. Question. Sure. It's basically my creation. I did look at how they've done it for um, Canadian meter marks and U.S. meter marks and what the aspects were that they used. And then there is a book called the International Meter Stamp Catalog. Um, it's a wiki book online. So if you just Google the International Meter Stamp Catalog, it's got all the world. Um, they just do a numerical listing and they don't kind of get into the minutia that I'm interested in. Um, 
But it was interesting when they wrote that, they did look at my information I had and they completely rewrote the section on Botswana. So I know I'm the world expert on this. <laughs> so that's what I tell people. If you want to be the world expert on something, pick something obscure like meter marks and then pick an obscure country and you'll become a world expert. Does a price correlate with uh, the manufacturer of the meter? Um, not necessarily, which is, that's a real challenge for this. And that's why um, I've done it by type rather. If you look at United States, they often have the uh, license number. If I just back up here. So you'll often get in here rather than this. Botswana started and they had like a UA and they had a S and they were different manufacturers. And here you'll, what you often like PB is Pitney Bowes and then they'll have like uh, just a P which is Postalia I think it is. And they, so in the States they use these uh, prefixes to determine the machine type. And they started with that in Botswana but after about five years, they just went to R and everything became an R. So it's very hard to distinguish. Um, I've used the International Meter Stamp Catalog because you can, some of them you can determine, but there's often some repetition. So you'll have two different manufacturers and the dyes they've used to make these are the same. So it's, um, it's a bit of a challenge to tell which machine has made them. So it's a little bit different than you see um, in uh, states perhaps. So with these guys here, these are the official free marks. So this is the hand stamp. So it's all done with hand stamps. And uh, if you look at the regulations, um, what it says is you have to identify who you are. So that's the Unified Local Government Service. You have to give some information about your address and then stamp it official free. And it has to be on one of these envelopes. It says on Botswana Government Service. So they have to do that. Um, so just with these, um, looking at how I did this, uh, This is the, the um, typology over on this side here, and there's some things like there's multi-line or straight line. So sometimes you'll get, uh, if you look, this would be a multi-line because it's got all that information in it. Sometimes they just have a hand stamp they've applied that says official free, and then they've applied another hand stamp that gives the other information. So I'm uh, looking at these sort of official free parts. So then distinguishing those, like if a uh, multi-line, is it a rectangle or an oval or a circle? Um, the outer border, how many outer borders do they have? Do they have one or two? And is it uh, thick or thin? Um, are there stars sometimes applied? And then getting down into the variety, looking at the users and, and dimensions and things like that. On the straight line, they might have no lines. There might be a line above and below. Um, they might be boxed or, again, an oval kind of shape. Uh, and then dimensions and color and user again. Yep, they are. Uh, I've kind of kept an eye on them both. There is actually in the um, uh, journal for the uh, Botswana and Bechuanaland Society, there was a listing that was in there and they did list uh, ones from Bechuanaland. Um, obviously much more rare and harder to find, but again, there's a huge variety in how they're done, which is very similar to this. I actually don't know that because I haven't actually looked at those ones so much. So I tend to, uh, I focus on Botswana and uh, I actually, and this material is kind of weird. You have to really look for it. It doesn't sort of pop up that easily. So I actually really haven't seen that much from those other places where I've uh, had the time to pay attention to it. So I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you would know, Peter. Sure. In that I have a meter cancel from Congo and one from Katanga. Yep. And they're very similar in pattern to what you were showing earlier. Yep. So uh, with, with the, uh, le the letter and number in the lower corners, but with uh, Katanga at least, we've identified some of them as far as who was it assigned to. Yep. 
yeah, I've got, I've been very fortunate when I lived in Botswana, I managed to get into the uh, post office, look at their file for the meter marks and uh, managed to uh, make some copies of that information. But it was interesting because in the mid 90s, they started to reissue license that hadn't been used and they just used whiteout and whited out over the old ones. So like I was there holding it up to the light, trying to see through the, the windows and see if I could see what was written underneath, which was a challenge. Um, I have managed because I've got such a, a number that I've managed to collect over some time. And I was very fortunate uh, to get a collection from a fellow who lived there in the 70s to actually identify the companies by the covers. So I could kind of go back, but no information on sort of issue dates or anything like that. But I, I imagine, um, as with much of Southern Africa, the uh, equipment was all probably coming from South Africa, so they would all be using similar suppliers and things like that, so I could see the, uh, the imprints looking very similar. So did you have another question? Uh, I, I just have some free prints on, on meters in my Eastern Yeah. So, uh, I'm just curious. curious. How they compare. Yeah. No, it would be interesting to see. So um, you're welcome to have a look at my exhibit. I also have a website. Um, postalhistory.ca and uh, this typology is on there. Typology? Yeah. Well, that might give you a comparison, but if you look at the International Meter Stamp Catalog as well, yeah. that would be a really good place because they'll have, inf have you been there? Yeah. So uh, working on my official freeze and looking at the typology for this, uh, what I've been trying to do is get like a verbal shorthand here. Like they're so different, everyone's almost individual. But it's still interesting if you're talking to somebody to be able to describe it with a little bit of a, a shorthand or what are the similar characteristics. So when I've looked at these, I've like broken them into multi-line versus straight line. And then what's the grouping? So is it a rectangle, a rectangle, two curved corners or four curved corners oval? And the outer borders, um, are there interior lines? Do they have stars? And then I've assigned just a sort of a shorthand code that. So if we look at this code here at the top, RN, 0N, rectangle, no outer border, uh, no interior lines, no stars. So, but if we went down to this one, RS, OY, rectangular, or, uh, single outer border, uh, oops, sorry, yeah, single outer border, no interior lines, yes, it has stars. So it's just a way for me to kind of sort it as I'm trying to do it. And uh, these things become important in a little bit when I talk about uh, sort of the cataloging of them. That's, that's partly the reason why I'm getting into this. So if we look at these, here's just the variety of all the kinds we can see. So, you know, oval, with some lines, here's oval with three different lines and the official free in a square box in the middle, just rectangle and stuff. I've set up for myself and actually, uh, here I can share that around with you. If you're interested in looking, that's just sort of my typology of the the um, official free marks and how I've kind of done it and organized it for myself so I can take that with me if I go someplace and be able to look through there and see if I've got one of those or not. This is uh, again like the database that I've got set up for it. So what I've done is uh, again, uh, what's the type and the department that uses it, location, some things around dimensions. I keep track of quality as well because sometimes if I'm looking to put together an exhibit, I can just look through, get a list, and what's the most uh, excellent mark of that so I can pull it out rather than having to search through them all individually to have a look at them. Uh, I've also added uh, on some other ones who owns it because, again, I'm interested in the typology and all the different types. So I own some. I've seen some in, uh, as copies in uh, journals or in auction catalogs and things like that. So... Uh, Typically, the way I'm sorting this is uh, in my typology there is by that sort of type. Um, and I add dimensions on here. These are uh, straight line ones because that also just distinguishes them a little bit. And then by the company that's used it. So if you look in that uh, booklet there, that's how they're done. So government printed envelopes. Uh, not the stamp here I'm interested in, but I'm interested in this and how that works. <laughs> That's the way the cover came. And I'm not sure why the stamp is on that one because again, if it's on Botswana government service, typically it should have a official free mark and be used for that. It shouldn't actually need a stamp. No, it was going to uh, Tonoda. So it was leaving from Khabaroni. Uh, so I 
probably somebody who just grabbed the envelope uh, and used it. Uh, and uh, they shouldn't, they, it was kind of like an illegal use, like where we used to have the, um, where you they emboss the stamps and different things like that. The pre-cancels and things like that, that was a way to try to control personal use of stamps. So this one's probably a personal use of an envelope where they shouldn't have been using it. Although it is going to the uh, College of Education, so, but again, it might have been a teacher there sending it into the College of Education with some information, so this probably might have been considered personal use. So, uh, again, um, as I said, I wasn't looking at this until Peter got me into it. Uh, the challenge with this is the printing of these things, unlike registered envelopes, was never done by a security printer. It's not official. So all it had to say was on Botswana government service on it. So they would just hire a local company to print the that on the envelopes for them. So there's a huge variety of these. It's very hard to kind of get them into some systematic typology of uh, how do they work. But uh, being a collector, I try to make a typology and, and sort them in some way. So some of the things here, if we look, there's different inscriptions we can have. So on Botswana government service, on Botswana postal service, before Botswana became independent in 1966, uh, and it was the Bechuana land you would have on Her Majesty's service or on His Majesty's service. You get some just on government service, uh, OHMS. Uh, you get some that are uh, OHMS, IDVHW. That's uh, on His Majesty's service, uh, that's the initials for that in Afrikaans. So they'd used uh, an envelope from South Africa that had both on it, put a Botswana stamp on it, or it might have been coming from uh, Mafeking. Again, that's an interesting part of the history of Botswana, was before independence, the capital was actually in South Africa, not in Botswana. <laughs> it was in Mafeking where they had their capital. Um, the other thing in terms of just trying to further distinguish them is looking at the grouping. Is there a logo on them? So sometimes you'll get the on Botswana Government Service or on Botswana Postal Service will have a logo. Uh, is the uh, on Botswana government service underlined? Is it a serif font? Um, and what's the case? Is it all uppercase? Is it upper and lowercase? Is it uh, you know the uh, large uppercase for the first letter and then small uppercase for the rest? Looking at the style of the font, and boldness, and then the size of the setting and the color are other things that kind of help me distinguish between those. So in terms of organizing these, I start with the first part is there's a prefix. So on Botswana Government Services, OBGS, on Botswana Postal Service, OBPS, and then others. And then looking at the different parts of that is uh, what's going on. So the presence of the logo is the first thing. Does it have a logo or not? Uh, the first split, and then after that, it's looking at is the, are the words underlined or not underlined? Are they serif or not serif? Um, is the capitalization all uppercase, lower and uppercase, or small caps? And then assign a type, and that uh, the number is just based on sort of the sequence of discovery for me. So there's not uh, it's not related to dates or anything like that. It just seemed to be the easiest way is just to do a running system. So if we look at these examples here, um, we have uh, on Botswana government service. This is USS01. So what that means is it's underlined sans serif uh, and I think it was a U wasn't it at the end there uh, uh, yeah it's an S so that means it's a small caps all small caps so if we look at that you can see how that works over here we have N double S U so it's uh, not underlined it's sans serif so no serifs on it and uh, I always got to go back to remember what it is U all uppercase there's a whole variety of those and so again I'll uh, show you just uh, what that looks like so um, what I've done with this is I've uh, there's a number of articles that are in the um, Philatelic Society of Greater Southern Africa in the journal for that I've just kind of taken some of that information and put it in there just as a document to share but with just talking about all the different types so uh, I think it was over the last year or so I've put in three articles on this to talk about these so uh, again, this just another sample here. Um, this was a uh, USU, so it's uh, underlined, sans uh, serif font, and all uh, uppercase. Stamps again, yeah. And this one's this one's going to the United States, so they probably 
Yeah, they're stamps because it's entering the international postal stream, so they can't send it free of charge because the other countries won't provide carriage free of charge. Yep. And again, here's the database for this. Uh, so what I've done is I sort according to the inscription or what the words are. There's the setting type. So it's, uh, you know, I've got that little prefix OBGS and then the NSSU08. Then I marked out the size, what's the color. I was also keeping track of the envelope types for a while to see what kind of paper they were on and things like that. Um, I may get back to that at some point, but this was getting into such minutia uh, that it was uh, starting to uh, seriously cause me. I actually haven't. I had started to do that again, so there's this, I, I called it knife, um, which was looking at how the backs of the envelopes were cut and how they were folded and things like that. But again, it was getting into such minutia that I, I thought I'd first of all, let me just get the database set up with the sort of major differences. Because again, um, with all these differences and them not being printed by a security printer, there was just probably thousands of varieties. And uh, like you almost consider almost every one I've seen individual in a way. There, so it would be interesting to go through and do that and see are there sort of groups or uh, different departments that did seem to have one printer that did a whole bunch of them for them or how that worked. Uh, registration labels. Uh, so just uh, again, it's just these things that we have here that designate or got stuck on uh, when the mail was getting mailed. I'm still under construction here on this and trying to figure out how to do this. I've looked uh, in the uh, runner post, uh, which is a journal for the uh, Bechuana Land and Botswana Society, and there was a start of uh, typology for this, um, and I've only just sort of recently discovered that. So uh, my goal is, is to go through this and to see if I can tie this into the system. Um, it seemed to be quite complex for my needs, but uh, again, I think trying to build on what exists might work. Um, the way I've been doing it, uh, to just keep things sorted for myself, is looking at the location. So what uh, town or village was it from? Then you could have different marks. So it could be a label, um, it could be a hand stamp, or it could be manuscript, uh, where people have just written it out, and then um, varieties by sort of the font. So uh, again, when I've got my little uh, booklet here, and I can <laughs> share that around as an example of how to look at all of those. Um, but this is a couple of pages out of it. And again, so we look at like Mopipi as uh, one there. So here's a, uh, where's a good one here? I want to get one that's got m multiple. So uh, OC or Arapa, there's a good one. So there's a number here. So we've got this one was just the stuck on. Here's some other ones that were kind of licking sticks and things. You can see how the R's are different here. Sometimes the numbers in these parts are different. I've just numbered them according to the discovery. There's not, they're not related to time. This was just happened to be the first one I've seen. This was the second type I've seen, third type, fourth type. So it just lets the sort of typology for me expand as I need to. And I don't have to reserve space for uh, numbers that may or may not show up. Uh, permit mail is a more recent uh, piece. And again, uh, this is under construction as well. Just trying to think about it. But it's interesting if you look at this slide here. This has obviously been printed with the envelope. Um, but if you look at this one here, it's obviously a hand stamp that they've made. It's got the same look, but they all, all have the same look. So again, I'd be interested in looking to see if there's regulation or something from the company um, because uh, Botswana Post was, became a parastatal or a, a sort of independent third party company in 1989. Um, and so again, they're setting up some of these new things like permit mail or bulk mail. And you don't have the regulations in the uh, legislative works of the, the country. So how they've determined this, how things need to look, and how they sort of enforce that would be uh, interesting to find out. But these ones here, what I'm doing is just looking at uh, sort of to try to group them as permit number. Is it printed or is it hand stamp? And is there any differences in the font on that mark? So the problem I'm having is you can have one cover and it's got multiple marks that I'm interested in. So this cover, for example, has three things. So it's got the Ombudswana Government Service. What's that? It's got the registration label and it's got an official free mark. My problem is how do I keep all this stuff straight? How do I know what I have? How can I find this cover? Because, oh, geez, I'm working on stuff related to registration labels. 
how do I know where to put that so I can find it uh, in the future? So what I uh, did uh, is think about a session numbering system. So if you're familiar with libraries, there's like the Dewey Decimal Code is uh, what's on the spine of the book, but that isn't the accession number. The accession number has to do with when they've acquired it. So the um, Dewey Decimal is how do I sort it and put it on my shelves, but the accession number is what the library uses to know what they actually have in their holdings. So if the book left um, or it was discarded, they could get rid of that accession number out of their system and they know they don't have it, but the Dewey Decimal System it still exists there and other books can slot into that Dewey Decimal piece. So my wife's a librarian, so this was her wonderful idea. Uh, so she was into helping me to sort things. So if we look at my overall organization, now this looks super complicated, but all it is is it's a grouping of the charts that I'd shown you before. Um, so across here, like there's the dominant mark and I've just put it up there. So meter mark, official free, government printed envelopes, registration mark, permit mail. So those are the things I'm interested in. I've numbered them because this is kind of mer meter marks are my primary interest where I started and then the second one, third one, this, and then this information in these colored boxes below is just the how you sort them into your types and things like that. So this is the basis of the system that I use to try to keep things sorted. So I set my priority on the previous table. So if I look at a cover and, oh, it's got a meter mark, that's what I start with that number and I give it a, uh, a session number according to that. If it doesn't have a meter mark, I go back and I'll look and say, okay, does it have an official free mark? Yep, okay, I can do an accession number based on that. Doesn't have one of those, oh, it's gov just government printed envelope. Okay, accession number based on that. So that's the way I kind of get the thing. So it's a priority system like that. Um, the way it works is in this table below here is uh, if it's the meter, so I prefix BMM, Botswana meter mark, BOFM, Botswana official free mark, OBGS, on Botswana Government Service, RL, Registration Labels, Permit Mail, PM. So I'll write in pencil on the back, I start BMM, and then I'll put for the meter marks, for example, license number, prefix and date, um, and if there's the same date, I'll add a letter. So if we look at this example over here, BMM means it's a meter mark, 096R, so it's license number 96 uh, with a letter on it of R, the date 09, so that's 2009, uh, 12 is December 22nd. And then I have ABC if I've got a couple that are on the same day from that license. Um, this is a more recent one, um, the Botswana meter mark. The license number is 06526, so they've started a new license numbering system. So in 2003, thereabouts, all the meter machines had to be replaced in the country because before you had to take your meter machine in to get the it charged up with the uh, amount of money you want to have on it. 2003, they went to uh, an electronic system where you uh, load it up through the internet. And all, and they made all the companies change over to this new one, so they instituted a new license numbering system. And then just again, it's the date at the back there, so 2005, January 09. So that's way so I can sort them in a box by that. So I just start with the, the start there. The official freeze. All I do is I just give them a BOFM and then it's just a sequential acquisition number. This is when I got it. So again, it's to look at, uh, it's not sorted in the box in that way, but I can sort through my database and pull out things that have similar characteristics that way, but I can always reach into the box and find it. Um, the uh, government printed envelopes is the same thing with the sequential numbers. Registration labels, what I've done with them is give them a uh, four letter uh, abbreviation of the name. So uh, H-I-B-R there is short for Hebron, or Haberoni would be G-A-B-O. Um, Haberoni Station, G-A-B-S is what I've used for that. Um, and then a sequential acquisition number. And then the permit mail um, is just the uh, permit number. So this is permit number uh, 10012. And it's just the 30th one that I've got of that. So again, they just sort by things. So the, the purpose of this isn't to organize them into some way that I'm going to display, but it's sort of in some way that I can find them. <laughs> so again, I put them in boxes, so I'll have a box that will be just of my meter marks. And again, if I look through, I can, they're all sorted by this uh, license number and then the date, so I can very quickly find stuff. Um, or, if, okay, it's uh, BOFM, then I go to the uh, official free box and look in there and just pull it out by the numbers. So it's, I've actually found the system works really well. Um, the challenge has been for me, it's kind of built up over time. So I'm 
adding to my databases, looking back and saying, okay, what stuff did I acquire 10 years ago that has registration labels on it? So now I can go into my uh, system and sort by the sort of registration labels and I can pull that out and uh, record that in my registration label um, database and uh, but then file it back into under the first number and then I know in the future if I'm looking for it, okay, it's not in the registration labels box, it's in the meter mark box. Pardon me? In process. I've got about uh, 500 left to go. <laughs> so it takes time. That's my winter evenings as I sit there and just enter uh, data in the database. Um, so lessons learned from trying to do this. And, and so if I was talking to somebody about doing this in the future, I'd say, okay, think about the future with it a little bit. Like, how do you think this is going to work? I built the meter database first because that's what I was interested in. These other interests came along. So I've uh, had to add things. And I thought about each type of information on the cover separately. So I did a meter mark database and a registration label database and an official free mark database. And they're all separate. Um, so therefore, as I'm entering information about the covers, I have to enter it two or three times in the different databases. Whereas it would have been much better to have just set up one master sort of database with the accession number and put on the basic information like the date of the postmark or the date of the cover and I don't know if there's other things like uh, where it's from and going to and the rate that was used on it and things like that and then have the other databases call to that database like have a relational database and use that accession number as the key piece of information and then the other databases just go into that. So I'd only have to enter some basic information once. Now I'm having to do it multiple times. And that's more work, but it also introduces the ability to have more errors. So I could have the same cover and I maybe just mistype something on the date. So there I am thinking, oh, I've got this cover and it's this date. Well, no, actually it isn't. I've got the wrong date in it. So it uh, and I could have two different dates for the same cover in the two different databases, which I don't think is so good. Um, I do like, and I think the prefix part has worked for me, because again, I'm looking at these things for different reasons and how do they work. Um, that seems to work really well and lets me kind of have groupings of things that I'm interested in. So if I'm just in interested in looking at my covers um, on uh, meter marks, then it's all in one place. Uh, it's sorted in kind of a logical way. The official freeze less so. So again, I have to access the database if I'm trying to think about something or think about a display or some kind of story I'm trying to tell about that. But it, it worked quite well. So that's the talk on uh, what I've sort of learned and the struggles I've had. Um, I think I've shared around some of the, the uh, little sort of booklets and things that I've got on that. Um, I uh, am happy to talk to anybody about it anytime. Uh, pass on my learning if I can be of help. Very happy to do that. Um, there's my email address is there. My uh, postalhistory.ca is up. I'm saying it's out of date. The website's out of date. It's based on probably 2010 and it only looks at the meter marks. So I'm hoping by the end of next year to actually update that and have all this information all in all these different types up. But uh, I do have a, a real life outside of stamp collecting. So sometimes finding time to do these things can be a challenge. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But again, uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. So thanks very much. Question. Yeah. Um, your mystery cover that you showed us. Yeah. With all the different hand stamps on it, um, was going out of country. So. Yeah. But it doesn't have stamps on it. Yeah. So what's the deal there? So I'm wondering because it's sent from the post office. So maybe because it's sent by the post office, it's also sent from the philatelic section. So again, I'm wondering if maybe because it's related to philately and the UPU would have probably been supportive of philately. Maybe they let things related to uh, philately go free. I'm, again, I'm not sure. I, that's a very good question. I hadn't thought about that. The, the reason I asked is that I'm, I'm still trying to figure out why sometimes you see stamps on OHMS covers yeah. going overseas and sometimes you don't. I mean, generally going to Britain, you don't see them, but you often see them, or you usually see them going to other countries. But there are exceptions to that too, and I'm just wondering what the actual rule is. Yeah, and that's, it would be interesting to look and see 
there are things maybe from Commonwealth countries to other Commonwealth countries, maybe they could go free. And maybe if you're going outside the Commonwealth, you have to, like, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of answers as, as, because I'm looking at this one's to uh, Port Elizabeth, so that'd be South Africa. And so again, uh, in, so within the Commonwealth. Yeah. They may have considered that in general. Yeah. But in 67, yeah. yeah. South Africa was not part of the Commonwealth. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 So because they were but the relationship they were expelled. Was, yeah, expelled. But Botswana... But they were in the Southern Africa Postal Union, yeah. probably. Yeah. So that might be another one, Southern South Africa, Africa Postal Union, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, that'll be... A, that's There's an interesting thing. So what I need to do is actually mark whether my covers have... And I do this, mark whether they have stamps on them or not. <laughs> so again, I could do... Once I get them all input, I could go through and say, okay, show me all the covers that don't have stamps on them. And I could pull all those out and then start sorting them a little bit differently to see if that would help answer that question that you've had. Because that, that is a really interesting question because part of the thing I was doing with my exhibit that I just put in here was updating to add rates. So I was very interested in rates uh, and exploring um, what was the rate on the cover? Why did they pay that? So again, here, would, that's kind of, this is a rate-related question, which, uh, which I actually find quite interesting these days. So The other question, um, are all the... Those government service covers unbleached paper. I noticed that the registration envelopes are all in white paper. Yeah. These are all brown. Um, lots of them are. There are a group um, from, I'll say, the 80s, where there were some that were printed on uh, like white um, security envelopes. So they're printed on the inside, so you couldn't hold them up to the light and see. But typically, uh, a lot of the government uh, printed envelopes or government use envelopes in Botswana seem to be relatively cheap paper. You see, like you get some that are really rough, like kind of almost cardboardy craft paper where they kind of shred a little bit, and then you get some better quality. This would have been one of the better quality sort of craft paper ones. Is the paper manufactured in Botswana or is that imported? It would probably all be imported. I don't think there's any paper manufacturing there. So it, again, it, maybe it's a, I'm not sure if it's a matter of cost. Uh, Certainly at the outset, um, it could have been uh, Botswana when it got independence was one of the third poor, it was the third poorest country in the world. And then six months later, diamonds were discovered. So by the mid 1990s, it was a middle income country. Um, it's actually a very interesting history. Uh, like all the money's been used, universal education, universal health care, um, lots of investment in infrastructure. I, I lived there for eight years, probably uh, one of the safest places I've ever lived. Um, so not the sort of typical um, struggles you see in many other post-independence countries. So, so it was interesting, but probably in the 70s and things, uh, they were probably getting less and less support from England over time, and uh, money was probably still tight, so they might have been buying less, uh, um, lesser quality paper and things to do things, because they were, uh, as government, watching the, the money. If you look at some of the covers from Zimbabwe, they were in very poor paper. Yeah. The, the registered envelopes and stuff. But it's so, and that's an interesting thing too, because I think Botswana, very closely tied to South Africa in many ways, it was a frontline state, and even during the pre apart end of apartheid, apartheid times, they were buying a lot of stuff from South Africa and cooperating with them, but I think they were also looking for other markets to supply things. So they might have been buying from Zimbabwe, and maybe that's where some of the lesser quality paper they have has come from because they would have been supporting their neighbors in that way. So yeah, but yeah, you get some that it, I'm sure it's very similar paper to what you see for Zimbabwe, very poor quality. I'm trying to figure out how to put these things in. I've been noticing with some of my covers, the uh, glue on the backs starting to kind of bleed through a little bit. And I'm worried that's going to, like I just stack them in a box and they're sort of touching each other. I'm worried that that glue is going to discolor the cover behind it. So. Uh, might be a process of uh, just making some separators out of uh, acid-free uh, chart paper or something and just throwing them in or something like that. But again, it just makes it harder to handle. A lot of money to spend on things. Is it that cheap? Yeah. Yeah, I'm spending, like, they, the envelope probably costs two cents or something like that, and you're buying it online for five or ten dollars. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> if only they'd known. Yeah. So you, you, you use the same system for, for basically for any, any kind of, I mean, the postal history, you're only, interested, you're only interested in the stamps and postmarks and, 
and that kind of thing. We use the same setup, the same system. Yeah, so anything I get in, I try to put in my system. Um, yeah, but you, you, but can a, you can create a, a database the same way. Yeah, so again, like, uh, there's, I've got a bunch of stuff that I'm interested in postmarks. Um, so I'll probably, there is a pretty good postmark system for Botswana, so I'd probably use that. But again, if it didn't have any of this other stuff on it, I would look at using that as some kind of a session numbering system. Yeah, you, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, then I can throw it in and sort it any way I want. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much for your time. Hope you enjoyed that. Happy to have a chat anytime or answer any questions if you want to reach out to me by email. Thanks.